Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Good to start. Um, so just an introduction about myself. Um, I'm Jeremy Baskin. I worked for Unilever for about 25 years. Um, did various roles from engineering and ended up being the um, group uh, global SNOP director, so rolling out SNOP and planning systems to 140 countries. Then with Johnson & Johnson, and after that, uh, Coca-Cola. And for the last seven and a half years, I've been helping companies improve the way that they operate their business and their, their, their plannings. So that's a little bit about me. Um, I want to just talk about some context in terms of what do we call the business excellence framework. So when we start talking about it, we always talk about leadership. Leadership is key to making any of the changes or anything that goes with this. And then we talk about process and we then talk about systems and people come later. And the reason why we do that is because what we focus on is actually the leaders have the intuition to say, we need to change processes or we need to get the right processes in place. And also we need to make sure that we have the right tools or systems that enables our people to effectively, effectively do the job. And once we've got all of that, then it's all about that master data because anything in that comes in goes out. That's what we look at. And, and from that, we talk about the strategy. So what, what is the strategy? What do we want to deliver for the next five to 10 years or even three years at the moment? So very clear about those goals and where we want to go to, and then how we actually execute that from an operational point of view. And then we deliver those results. So I'd, I just wanted to bring that framework together because when we start talking about operational excellence, we start talking about how we run our operations. So in that uh, strategic, we start looking at what is our categories, what is our capacities over the long term, what's our financial plan, and then we need to take that overarching plan and say, right, let's put it into what are called monthly buckets. So we can execute that from a marketing and a production plan, a demand plan, a supply plan, understand what those gaps and the choices are to create an operational plan, and then we go into the execution. And what we're finding today is we call this here the static plan, and here we call this the active plan. Because effectively what happens is you set your static plan, but how do you execute it? And as soon as you start executing, you find that there's quite a lot of differences. We don't have a perfect plan in today's world. So how do we manage those differences, and how do we react to those differences? Those are some of the things I'm going to share with you today and talk about how do we manage those. But one of the keys that we also need to understand is to say, the biggest challenge that we have in our businesses today is people don't know what's in the plan. We're asking people to sign off a plan. We're asking our marketing head of marketing or head of sales or head of supply, you need to sign off this plan because you own this plan. But a lot of people don't actually know what's in that plan. And that's why we need to start making those plans more visible. So what we say is, Understand what are those visible assumptions in the plan? So what have people put in incremental in terms of promotions or risk and opportunities? Make those gaps visible and also make those risk and opportunities visible in the plan, both from a supply point of view and both from a demand point of view. Otherwise, if we don't have that visibility, how do we ask a leadership person to sign off a plan and every time we don't deliver the plan? Why don't we deliver it? Because we don't know what's in the plan. Um, so those are the focus areas that we should be looking at from, from, from our, our, you know, to restore control back in our business. We start off with our product plan, and what we've started to see is our product plan, whenever we want more revenue, we just stick more products in. And what COVID learned us, COVID taught us on how to focus. Because all of a sudden, we only had a finite amount of resources. If you look at Unilever, they only had a finite amount of resources for Marmite. So they said, instead of making 125 grams, 250 grams, 500 grams, 750, they said, during COVID, we're only making 250 grams. Because we've got a finite amount of resources, that's where we're going to focus on. But we intend, you know, the business doesn't always understand what does that do to you? What does that do to you from an inventory point of view, from a production point of view? How does that affect your supply chain? And that's why we need to link all of these things together. Similarly, from a sales plan, when we start putting in any promotions or any uh, uplift, what does that mean to the business? And also from a financial part. And once we really understand what that means from a planning part, then we can go into what we call executing our supply chain. So the supplier requirements, the supplier 
uh, control and the supplier orders. I'm going to talk about supply orders quite a lot today because the supply orders is actually the key thing that drives everything in our business. It drives your inventory. Inventory just doesn't appear. It happens because of supply orders. And it's how we manage it and how we control it is, is, is very clear. But before we get onto that, we want to talk about planning itself. So w what we see planning is, we say, going back to that uh, previous chart is to say, First of all, we had a product portfolio planning. So we have R&D and marketing building their plans. Some of them are using TPM tools, trade promotions tools, and various other things. Then we have a baseline forecasting. So baseline just use some statistical based on past history. What do we think is going to happen in the future? We overlay some insights of temperature or, or um, uh, various uh, other big events that come on top of that. And that sits generally. I don't know where it sits in your business, but we, we normally see it, it ends up in the majority of businesses we see and I've been involved with, it ends up being in the supply chain. They decide what the baseline is going to be. And then we've got our customers, our sales teams, then they're going off and creating their plans. They've got their CRM system and they're creating their plans and they're busy planning a way for all their big events. And we think, okay, we'll bring all three of these plans on three different systems and three different processes together into a demand plan. And how do we validate that plan? And who owns that plan? Is it the demand plan who owns the plan? Is it the sales exec who owns the plan? Is it the marketing exec who owns the plan? Who owns this plan? But what we do is we go and ask someone in our business, either the VP of sales or VP of marketing, say, you need to sign off this plan. They don't know what's in this plan because everybody's had a go at putting it in, and they've all put it in, laid in different information at different hierarchies and at different times. And then we get the revenue plan out of that. So what do we do from a supply chain? We take, I think we take the demand plan, um, and we create a supply plan. That supply said, this is what we're going to produce, and this is what material we need to buy. But actually, we should be also... Some people do a master plan where they say, based on that demand, based on all your policies, this is what your inventory projections look like. And against those inventory projections, then we create a supply plan. So we see quite a lot of organizations creating a supply plan, but actually not doing a master plan. We then, from that, master, that supply plan, we then create what we call supply orders. So those are purchase orders, production orders, and stock transfer orders. And from that, we then get into our detailed scheduling, and from there, we can work out, oh, how much cash do we need to run this plan, and how much margin we're going to make. So businesses have all struggled with all these moving parts that have happened. So what did they do to say, let's coordinate these two together? So what did they invent 45 years ago was something called SNOP. So we took our demand plan, and we said our demand plan and our supply plan are going to match each other. But nobody knows how you've got to that demand plan, and nobody knows how you've got to that supply plan, and therefore, that's why it hasn't worked in the last 45 years. So now we have a lot of bright people saying, well, the reason why that's happening is because it's the product portfolio that you have, and it's also the cash and the margin that you have. We need to connect those together. So what did we do? We invented RBP. And we took IBP and we connected the product to the cash. We got the demand and we said, right, let's run with it. And now we've been running with, I think, IBP for the last 10 years or so. And we're all still struggling with it because we're not covering all the bits and pieces bringing it together. So what we talk about is multidimensional planning. So we bring this in and we connect everything together. So everything remains in one plan. It's one process to create that demand plan. It's one process from your master plan all the way down there. So it's all interconnected. And when we try and connect these together, it gets pretty complicated. Um, and the reason why it gets pretty complicated is because things are at different, what I call different levels and different hierarchies, which we'll have a little chat about. But before we go on to that, we need to understand what what value does this deliver from us? So if we're going to have a look what value this delivers from us, we say to ourselves, right, traditionally we said all we need to do is improve forecast reliability. That's it. We improve the forecast, we're reliable, we can make everything, we won't have any problems in our business. 
But the reality is, in today's world, supply reliability is more volatile than forecast uh, volatility. But we're not measuring it. Is anyone measuring supply reliability here? Not conformance to plan, but total supply reliability. So when you talk about supply reliability, we talk about your production orders, your purchase orders, and your stock transfer orders saying, this is the date I wanted due. This is the date that it actually arrived. Because it seems like sales saying, this is what I'm going to sell. And this is the actual, what I actually sold. So you've got those two, two. And once we've got those two, then we can start with our forecast accuracy and our supply accuracy. Then we can understand what our customer services and what our improved stock levels are. Reducing lead times is absolutely key. What we're starting to see is the world's lead times get longer all the time. China, the latest crisis now has just put it on. Brexit has put most businesses that export, and especially the food business, used to have between a three and four day lead time between making the stuff and having it in Europe. That's now moved to 21 days because what you do is week one you make, week two you get your documentation, week three you move. So your lead time's got a lot longer. That means you need to hold a lot more safety stock. So one of the most important things we talk about is supply order times because it's the time that it takes to, for you to restock. And generally, lots of businesses, we've got a two-week or three-week. And when you measure it, you've got 15 weeks or 16 weeks. That's a lot mm. of stock that you need to start holding in, in place. And then the other one is improved product management. It's the tail. I know the supply chain love to cut the tail. Um, and it's about how we manage that more effectively. So we all have some measures in place. We say forecast accuracy, a good forecast, a really good forecast accuracy is around about 80%. Most people are averaging between 65 and 70 percent. Anyone here in the 80s? No? Anyone here in the 70s? <laughs> OK, cool. So that means you've got a 30 percent error. So you're going to spend a huge amount of time improving from 75 percent or 65 percent to 70 percent. Is that going to solve all the issues got? Then the next thing we look at is supply accuracy. So what we're starting to measure is supply accuracy. A lot of businesses are between around about 95. And we're seeing that 5% of supply accuracy is driving far more volatility than 30% of, 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 of that demand variability because it's the way that you pull your stock together. The next one is the supply order time. That's um, 18. What we're finding is most businesses are running between four and nine weeks of, of supply order time on average. So it's the time that you order something until it comes. So you'll find some things are very quick, one or two weeks, but then you've got lots of long lead time. And as soon as you have that, and we'll show you just now, as soon as you have lead times longer, that just exacerbates your stock straight away. Um, we look at how our products work. So we look at volume, value, profit, and the number of SKUs that we have per category or product group, as we call it. Uh, we look at idle inventory by product group, and we look at our inventory projections and our inventory targets. So just from these KPIs, everyone looks after forecast accuracy. Anybody look, and uh, people look after inventory projections? Idle inventory? Product portfolio, there we go. Okay, supply order time, cool. Supply accuracy is the whole, or plan conformance. Okay, so the next thing we talk about is how do we forecast and at what level do we forecast? So what we find is that when you have a forecast in your business, what are you forecasting at? Are you forecasting at SKU? Are you SKU by customer, just at customer groups? And what period are you doing it? Are you doing it by location? And are you doing it monthly? What we find most businesses are doing it, doing it by SKU, by country, by month. What we also find is, where is most of your volatility driven? It's driven at a customer level. So what you find is if you're just forecasting at a SKU level, that volatility you're not actually picking up because it's masked against all the other customers and you're not seeing exactly what's going on. So what we find is 
if you start forecasting at a product group by customer, you get far more accuracy than doing it by SKU. And then when we do it by uh, forecast group by customer, what we're able to do is when we want to go down to the next level down, what we're able to do is we use a disaggregation factor of disaggregating that down to the customer level. So therefore we take that and we can see that SKU by customer to forecast that. And then when we get into the supplier side, which we call the product plan, we don't care about customer, we don't care about the forecast level, we just want to know what the product is, or the product group is. We want to know what the total is, we don't want to know what all the different customers are, we want to know by country and by monthly. Then we go off and create our master plan, which is all about your inventory and your purchasing and your supply, and generally we do it by product ID, total, by warehouse, weekly. And then our supplier orders, are, are by country, because we don't really need to know by warehouse, by weekly. So you've got all these different, not only you're trying to forecast at those, those, those different product groups, but when we start looking at the customer group, the marketing group, the supply chain, and the master, all of those, not only are they forecasting and planning at that, you're all planning at different levels and different ways of, of, of moving it around those levels. Does that make sense? So then we come to our supply chain, and when we look at our supply chain, we've got so many moving parts at the moment. We've got the customer, the market plans, the forecast, the weekly orders, going down into receiving, coming into processing, which all has different lead times, and then going outside to the delivery and the ship shipment. And what we're finding is a lot of businesses are still trying to do all of this on Excel. And, and, and what we're finding is there's lots of issues and lots of noise that obviously gets driven, driven through that because Excel is the best way that we control it. But when we do find that we have tools, we find some of those tools have got quite a lot of gaps in it. And because you've got gaps in it, a lot of stuff gets done offline. I don't know if anyone does all of the everything end to end here. Not everything. Not everything. Okay, cool. <laughs> and then we bring it back into the system. Okay. Um, so then we come back to the leadership again. We started with leadership, we come back to leadership. And traditional businesses says it's about 70% about leadership and people, it's about 20% about processes, and it's about 10% about systems. And what our leadership spend our time doing is they ensure we have cross-functional alignments because we've got all these different functions working in different spreadsheets or different tools. So they say, right, my job as a leader is to make sure that all you people are talking to each other and you, all you people are agreeing the same plan. And then we ensure that the assumptions are visible. So we want to know what's in there. We want to know that gaps are visible. We want to know that risk and opportunities are visible. We all want to work to one plan. And we all want to work in a consistent way. But we've all got different tools, different spreadsheets, different processes. So the leadership role is really focused on the top bit here. We very seldom see people in seven, eight, and nine where they say ensuring everyone keeps to the plan, ensuring the ownership, and ensuring the continuous improvement because we're spending all our time trying to get this to work. And as soon as somebody changes or a leader changes or someone in the team changes, we have to retrain them in how we work with things and how they need to operate. So there's, there's a lot of roles that we call the traditional leadership uh, need to focus on. So the challenges that we're seeing you know, across the business is each function has its own spreadsheet or system, and they all have their, their own workarounds to the plan. It's difficult to collate plans with different levels of granularity. So we saw those different levels of granularity that we, we look over that. Supply ordering depends on individuals' knowledge and capability. So supply people who go into supply have their little spreadsheets underneath their tables and it's working out how they're going to order things or how they're going to run their production plan or how they're going to uh, do their stock transfer orders. And, and we find that it gets quite messy pretty quickly. And it's difficult to, to, to identify and react to ex exceptions. So that's why you know, what we talk about is the product plan, the sales, the supply, finance, all coming together in the new world of multidimensional planning to give that output of the sales plan, 
the supply order plan, and the financial plan. So that sounds all lovely. But what we wanted to do is just show you for two minutes um, what, what do we mean by multidimensional planning and what does that uh, effectively look like? So when you come into, uh, this is just an example uh, that you can't see. Okay. So when you come into to a, a, a dashboard, what you want to be able to see, you want to see your product portfolio, you want to see your demand plans, you want to see your, your um, it's not working so well on the screen, uh, you want to see your, your ABC classification so you can see where your SKUs are, you can see your portfolio here which is showing you the size of the the size of the circle is the value of those, those, those products, and you can see where your portfolio goes. So you know that anything between zero and 30 is effectively linear. So you say, actually, I don't need to really forecast those. Between 30 and 80, we say that can drive some type of statistical modeling, so I can use statistical modeling. That above 80 is, becomes random. So that's where we need to focus our time, and it helps you understand where I need to focus from a portfolio, but also it helps you understand you know, all these little dots over here. These little dots here that are non-volatile are fine, but these dots that are volatile at the top here, what are you going to do about them? Um, in terms of, 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 of how you move this forward. Um, and, and the next thing here is you can see how much you've got on order. So what are, what are you planning to place on purchase orders, supply orders? What does your inventory look like? Where are your, where are your risk in terms of um, inventory risk or customer service risk as we call them? And where are your excess uh, inventory, in inventory sitting? So some of the things where you want to go from your planning horizon versus where you are from, from an operational, you can start jumping around very quickly where you say, okay, I need to understand why these cans are, um, why do I have this risk in my cans? So what we call this is, we need to go into the control, uh, there we go, the control, and from the control, we can go into see what our service risks are, and in our service risk, and I'll go and select cans, and in cans, uh, where's my mouse? In cans, what I can very quickly see is it's this product. I've got a risk of 7,300. That's the value. The average demand, how much I've got on hand. So your weekly demand is 826. I've only got 720 online. So I'm going to have zero by the end of the week. I've got 4,186 on order, 182 on the next PO, and the next PO arrives on the 19th of March. So you can go from a very high level all the way down very quickly. And so we go down uh, all these elements, and I'm not going to go through all of these, but there, there was just a couple I just wanted to, 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 to highlight to you is to say, what does your dashboard need to look like? And we call this DSI, Demand Supply Inventory, um, quite a lot of the times. So here you can see what your demand plan is, what your supply plan is in two areas. These are confirmed orders that you've created production or purchase orders or transferred orders. And here you can see requested orders so you can see what the system has generated or suggested that you need to purchase. And all of a sudden you can say, oh, can I afford that or not? You can see what your projected closing in inventories, weeks of cover and capacity. But this just shows you over here your demand, your supply, your weeks of cover, your inventory, and here's your what we call your supply order time. So this is a pretty good supply order time, but all of a sudden you can see all of those things brought together in, 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 in one place. And, and, and again, you can see, I keep losing my mouse here. Um, here you can select it for, for whatever you want to, want to exit it from, and again, here, this is just showing you this automatically creates all your uh, SNOP meetings. So you can see what your forecast performance is. You can see what your movement is from one, one month to the next month. So what your, what your changes are. You can see your latest uh, risk and opportunities and NPD. You can see your SKUs. 
And then when we get to an operational, we can see the changes in volume from the last forecast. This demo system was last done in September, so we're not doing it every month. Uh, and, and, and the latest one that we've just done. Um, and again, you can see what orders you currently have in the system and what you need and what your projection needs to do. And again, you can add comments, comments in. And similarly, you can see all your products and, and supplier plans, etc. cetera. Um, my favorite one is the balancing one because you can also see what your unmet demand is. So this is where you have your, your conversation around your unmet demand to say, actually, uh, what are we going to do about this? So those are key things that are automatically, automatically populated. So here you can see this is what we call the static plan. And again, you can see your static plan in a little bit more details uh, under these areas. And then we go into our sales plan. And within our sales plan, we go into each customer. And again, at each customer, what we're able to do, because of the way we disaggregate things down, is we're starting to be able to see um, what this is by SKU. Each one of these is SKUs. And you can go and add any uplifts, any reasons why we want to put an uplift on assumption or risk and opportunity. So if I go and have a look here at all my risk and opportunities, these are, I can see what they are. I can see a list here. Every time we put in an assumption or a risk and opportunity, we can see what that request is. So we have pure visibility. We can also see what our capacity is. So this is less than 50%. So this says, go and fill your boots. This is above 90% and this is uh, 100%. So this March, this 187 that you've requested here is where you've got 100, so people can see this. And again, you can go in and see who's created that. So Nico has created this. And here you can go and accept or, or, or decline this. And we've got full history of that. So that's how you're linking your main plans to your, sub, to, for, to your customer plans all in, all, all, in, all in one particular place. Oh, I also didn't show you this. And also in your product plan, here you have all your events. So all you need to do when you have an event, rather than going after marketing or sales, I'm putting an event in for X amount, say 100,000, and this is my particular event. How much are we going to sell? They generally pull out, if they're a good planner or a good uh, marketing or salesperson, they'll pull out of their bottom drawer a little Excel, and they'll say, oh, last time I sold this, I did this uplift. Now, what we do here is we don't leave that to chance. What we're able to do is just say, you need to put in what your investment is, and based on your investment, okay, this is for online, so this will show you what you, based on the different TikTok, Google ads, et cetera, what you do, how many customers you attracted last time you did that. So it automatically applies based on all those history on those events that you did, it will apply your revenue uplift. We take that revenue uplift and we disaggregate that down to your, to your product group. So we don't really, you know, it's interactive, but we're connecting those, those marketing plans. So those are what we call first-time customers um, um, down here. And then we have the returning customers or the regular customers, which more traditional is, is used to. And a similar one, we've got our what, what is the event, sales or discount. Here's my investment. And then it works out your revenue based on the event that you've had and the ROAs, which is kept in the system based on, on history. So now we're not asking sales and marketing to go and get their little Excel spreadsheet and come back. So, so this is what we're trying to do, is make everything visible from your events, from your assumptions, from your baseline. So everyone has complete and utter transparency uh, 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 across, across, across the board. Um, and then similarly in a demand, um, we go and select a, a demand group. And again, a demand group you, you can see this full product here. And again, you can take out lines, base forecast, uh, which is the other big one, uh, demand plan. And it brings it all down. So you can see what are the assumptions and risk and opportunities at the moment that have requested or what's been approved. So you can go and see all those level of, 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 of details. You can see your actual, your base. You can see what assumptions are based in your plan and what risk and opportunities are based in your plan. And here's your portfolio and all the different uh, details. So you've got that full transparency. And then similarly, you go and measure your forecast performance. So this is your forecast accuracy by, by SKU, by customer. 
Um, and you can see, you can go and see the differences and sort by, let's see what the biggest difference is or all the actuals. Uh, you can see this in units or in revenue at a customer level, at a SKU level, at a product group, et cetera. So you can start holding that down. So this is, this, this, is, this is for the month of January, but based off a one-month uh, one lag, you can set your lags, which, whatever lag you want to set in, and then you can go back and look at, 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 at past histories or past months, et cetera. Um, um, and as I said, this you can see it in units, and it's interesting to compare a unit and a revenue forecast because there's quite a big difference where that error is, is coming from. So you can that's now looking at it in, 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 in revenue, in your in your revenue forecast. So from all those plans, you then go and create your master plan. And from your master plan, you can see your inventory that you've created, and you can go and sort it by groups or products or whatever it is. That's in cogs, that's in units. Uh, that's in weeks of cover, and then it also shows you warehouse capacity. So you can then say, well, can I actually afford to do that plan? Oh, yeah, okay, I'm fine. We didn't go over 100% of our warehouse according to that plan that, 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 that we, 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 we've got here. Uh, I'm not going to show you all the other things, but, it, but um, the other important thing is the supply. So here you can see what your capacity is, what all your supply is, and you can see what, again, your confirmed orders and your requested orders uh, value, because a lot of our businesses are find that they get stuck with cash. Can they actually afford that plan? Can we afford to invest in, in, in that? And if you, this tells you what your confirmed orders are, what your requested orders, and what your outstanding orders are. And if you go into, for instance, one of these, you can see it in more detail about all your different orders. So there's your reorder point, your safety stock, and it takes into consideration your service level, your lead time, your uh, predicted variability. So you take your demand variability and you take your supply variability to get your uh, safety stock. Um, and, and it creates all the uh, other elements around that. Um, let me just go and have a look under inventory. I didn't sh yeah. Uh, Supply conformance, there we go. So the other one here, this is where you, you monitor all your orders. Here are your due dates and your arrival dates. So that's where you monitor your, effectively your supply, your supply accuracy as you, as you, as you, as you monitor it through. And then you can also take your, your, your rough cut capacity. So you can go and see your different lines or your different product groups. Um, here you can see your different uh, rough cut capacities. So on this particular product, bottles is made on three lines. Um, and you can see it weekly, monthly, or yearly. Uh, and if you haven't got any extra time, you can go and put, put, more, put more time on your lines, etc. Non-running time, all the rest that goes with it. And then the final one is the, the, um, the, the, the scheduling part, because here, when you come down into your execution now, now I'm, uh, now I'm in my execution mode. So when I'm in my execution mode, I can see for this particular production line, here, these are all my production orders, and this is when I'm, I'm running it all on this particular line, and you can see the, 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 the usage, 150%, 160%, so you can start dragging and dropping and the percentages uh, and everything moves around, so you can start doing that uh, to try and balance that line. But what we find going forward is that a lot of these, these, these uh, particular lines are, when, when we're looking at how we run a particular line, what we're finding is here we can see this is across multiple lines, so cans are done across three different lines three different locations, and some of these lines are actually over, over capacity. As you can see, it's gone down here and gone down, down to the bottom. Um, and so the next question is to say, well, maybe I need to pre-build or move stuff from one line to another line. So what we can do is we can go and press our optimizer, and the optimizer will, based on a piece of rules, will either move them to pre-build, so you can pre-build stock, or it can actually, uh, against some rules, optimize across different lines, and you can create that piece against there. So 
that just gives you a quick overview of, of how we you know, connect all those things into what we call multi-dimensional uh, multi planning. So let's get back to the presentation after just giving you some feel for what multi-dimensional planning. So we start talking about the way that we plan now is light touch or exception based, or some people actually want to do touchless, but we, we, we can do that if we want to, but as you can see, all you need to do is put in, this is what my event's going to be. We can see what that's going to be. We can automatically create that statistical baseline and then only see where the exceptions are. We can see where the exceptions are just from an inventory point of view, where the risks are, where the lots of money spends are that you can take exceptions. You can go into your supply plan and change your capacity and then you can see what your supply orders are and monitor those from that. So that's all contained in one way and that's how we're starting to talk about multidimensional planning. It brings all of those together into to, to one place. So what I wanted to just leave you with is saying there's six focus areas in terms of to keep the focus on. First of all, the product portfolio, the segmentation and where you prioritize those, those products are key. The second one is demand forecasting, the ability to generate and adjust with the market insights and validate. So we're bringing all of those things together. Aligned financial plan, so everything, we understand what the costs are from an inventory point of view, from a supply order point of view. And then we can establish what our supply requirements are from the demand plan, and then we can optimize that against the policies that we've set. Supply orders, we optimize those supply orders of what we can af afford for the production plans, purchase plans, and transfer orders, and then the, the supply control. So that's the detailed day-to-day -day controlling, and as you can see, as things go out of kilter, you're able to take those actions. But you don't need to go and back and replan. You only go and re back into your static plan and replan uh, on a monthly basis, but you're able to do that uh, control as, as you go through. So now let's think about our new business operation setup. As we talked about, it used to be 70% 70, 70 people in leadership, 20% systems, 10%, uh, uh, sorry, 20% process, 10% system. What we're saying is it's now all equal. You need to have those processes, you need to have those systems, and you need to have those people to work. And you can't just go to people overnight and say, let's change one of those. You normally need to do all three together to, to, if you want to make, make, make a change. And what we're finding is organizations that have this in place and are able to do multidimensional planning, all of this is visible and controlled in the system. We can see it and from a process point of view, from a process and a system point of view, and therefore the leaders only need to focus on those, those, those three items at the bottom, rather than not focusing on that and just focusing on the top. Um, so what I wanted to leave you with today was the takeaways to say, we need to change, it's no longer business as usual. We need to embed processes and tools into our ways of working. We need to have visibility of live decision and, try and treat supply orders as gold. Uh, and it's you who make the difference. Okay. So hopefully that was informative. I don't know if there's any questions. Yes, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, you touched with the term data source. Yes. Because this is all wonderful. Yes, yes. Yes. Should we say, let's say, buy to Excel and do some of the offline? Yes. As you mentioned, yes. commercial, for example. Yes. So when we speak about the trade plan. Yes. Um, how how you picture uh, the, the, the work, let's say, the process and the collaboration between the sales and the demand planning team through the system? Yes. So you very good question. So what we find is that you have multiple systems and you have multiple data of sources. What we've done in, 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 in our system that what I was demoing to you is we recognize, let's see if I can just bring that across, is uh, what we have is multiple data sources. So 
We have things called APIs that automatically fetch data where it's connected into a system, like into ERP to bring your inventory and to your sales. But where, you've, where, where, where you don't have that, what you are able to do, and this is, this is the beauty of it, is people have everything in Excel. So, oh, why does that keep doing that? Right. Um, everyone's having the Excel. So what you're able to do here is you're up, able to upload whatever you want to through Excel, through your stock, through your, if you want to bring a forecast, you want to bring a sales history, you want to bring a target, uh, it's on the other screen. You can also upload all your events that you're doing. So rather than having your marketing people having their events in their top drawer, that Excel that they use, all you do is you upload it, uh, upload it directly in here, and it's in the system for everybody to see, not just their department to see. Okay, and there is no limitation. For instance, I'm, I'm looking at the master data. Yes. You know, so like, you can do a mass upload. Yes, so yes. Like yes. Screen. So you can do two things. You can do... This is the download button, so you can download what's ever there, so you can see it and use it as a template. You can upload it, so you can upload it from uh, Excel, and we've got some really fancy uh, data integrity checks. And then also, you can go and view your master data over here, and you can actually edit it here if you've got the right rights in the system as well. I do have a question, and it might be a little bit provocative. Yeah. Yes. So where, where our strengths are, so where, where Anaplan's strengths are is on the financial side. So they, they, they and, and there's some financial things which I haven't shown you here, but yes, it's not as strong as, as, as Anaplan and is because it's very strong there. But where Anaplan starts to struggle is when you start getting into the statistical forecasting, those forecasting and bringing those forecasts in and then very quickly falls out when you start getting down into the production and the supply planning. So it's good in some areas and, and needs improvements in others. Okay. Cool. So we've got to stand around the corner. If you've got any further questions, pop in and say hello to us. And uh, yes, thank you for your time.